in Blackpool, I mean, it is a whole town. It is the, it is the last great English working class seaside resort, you know what I mean? It's the old traditional thing, and it's loose. I don't know why, but it's, it's survived, and it's actually growing back a bit, I reckon. smudging comes from the fact that the earliest form of photography was street photography and in those days they used plate cameras and sepia tone prints and when the prints were first produced they were wet and they looked smudged. Well, at least that's what I was told. <laughs> but one mistake and you've blown it. Will Count Draco strike the first blow? Will the princess be forced to marry someone she can't stand? <laughs> Well, this is the gold mine behind you, and it plays Oh Me Darling, Oh Me Darling, Oh Me Darling, Clementine, incessantly, non-stop, about 11 hours a day. Basically, this is a pitch where you worked on your own, so it can be tough, very tough. And uh, you go up, and again, you use your stereotypes, you know, woman on her own with kids, might not be able to spend that much money, man with younger wife with kids, bound to spend a lot on her, you know what I mean? And everyone basically cements her. The level they've got to cement the relationship is the level they're going to sling into pictures, you know what I mean? And it works like that. But I don't know who I'd work on here, see? It's just actually getting going the day and people just waking up. So after the first hour is quite dry. And you, when you've got to be on about the first 20 quiz, which you would get in the first hour, you, you, you then wake up yourself and think, oh, great, it's getting fluid, you know? And you start thinking, oh, that, oh right, you've seen him. And you grab the arm, stomp the, per the monkey on it, wrap it around the arm, touch your mouth and smile, click. Can I put the two of us together? And then you and oh. <laughs> who else is going on yeah. the boat? Then you and me. Uh, can I take the boat? Oh yeah, she's got to take the photo. That's true. Oh, well, it might bite me when you go though. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> oh, it's disgusting. <laughs> See, they banned monkeys because it was cruel. They're joking. They should ban human beings. Right, like, this sounds a little bit. Hello, mum. I've got a sheepskin scarf. <laughs> Said it ain't dead yet. It's organic sheepskin scarf. Ah, don't kill me! Right. Hello. Hang on, can you pull this head in? Can you do that? Pull its head in. <laughs> Mum, I'm having ready-made shoes. <laughs> you try things out and they say, uh, oh, hang on, what's going on? I said, she just had a picture down. You're going to stop her? <laughs> and so they go, oh, I wouldn't stop her. She's the boss of the family. Picture goes, you know. One for large, one for you two. If they're, often if they're sort of 30 or 40, you know, and they're, they're quite cool about it. Or they know what's going on. They don't mind spending a fiver, a fiver on um, two large colour pictures in gaudy little brown frames. You know, lovely. Often they come back saying, "Oh, great pictures, mate." So it's not all fraud. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it's fraud, but it ain't all fraud. Excuse me, wait a minute. I got a lovely one and it came in ready in two minutes. How much it cost? Well, the one fifty each, and I sold them two to get them straight away. They're big, are they? That's a side, but can't complete like that. I think I'll have my photograph taken. Step inside. Take that. Okay. All right. Is it Keirings? Hello, Keirings, please. Keirings are actually sold in twos. Hello, two. One for me, Mark. Two Keirings? It's nothing. <laughs> The, I think the first cameras that uh, arrived in Brazil uh, were Kodak cameras. So people d you, you didn't use to refer to them as uh, cameras or photograph cameras. They, they used to say, my Kodak. Do you have a Kodak? I'm going to buy a Kodak. So yes, I had a cousin who had a, a Kodak. I think this was the camera that uh, took the, 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 my first photographs of my life. One of the important uh, characters in this town, apart from the priest, the the, the major, uh, some politicians, it was the photographer. Um, the photographer was important because everybody had to go to him to take photographs. And for me it was magic because it was 
a closed door, he would disappear inside that room, and he would come out with the photographs. I was a, I was, I was a kid. I fi found it fascinating. Uh, he used to use some gloves because of the liquids. And um, it was very mysterious. He was a mixture of doctor, because maybe because of the gloves. Um, but it was very mysterious. If I think of the photographs that I take, um, I, I, I feel that there is, a, there is a feeling of possession, of power somewhere there, um, whereby you, you possess the object that you are photographing, um, or even the person. Um, I understand why many people don't like to be photographed. Can you do this for me like this? Yeah. Can you do that? You're on. Like that. Where's your other arm gone? Should you put it around here? Let's see. Put your chin up a bit. That's better. Put your head on your hand. That's it. Oh, yeah, that's better. Stay like that. Can you say sausages? Yeah. Sausages. <laughs> put your hand back to the back. See, you're not allowed to move. <laughs> stay very still. Put your chin right up. Yes. Well, this photo really makes me laugh. I think it's wonderful. I must be about five and a half there, and Brana, my sister, must be about six months. And I remember them saying, right, now, hold her on your lap. And I just remember refusing. I just didn't want her on my lap. I knew that really clearly. So then they said that they'd put her on a cushion. And she looks pretty oblivious. I mean, she looks quite happy. The thing about this photo is that I know what was going on. I mean, if I was to show that to anyone else, they might just say, well, how sweet, you know, or how nice. Looking at the photo is like also mourning for all those years that we could have been really, really good friends, that we could have been there for each other. And I hated her with a vengeance. I mean, not just mild dislike. When I see her dancing like that, I think a lot of the feelings come up for me that came up when she did it, which was that she was showing off. That she, I just wanted to kind of get in the way and push her aside. And I think, unwittingly, a lot of those feelings come up when I watch it, so that although I'm laughing and thinking how sweet, there was also the recognition that oh, she really knew how to steal the limelight. And our family wanted everything to be right. So I doubt they'd have taken photos of me looking really grumpy or kicking her or pushing her off a big mound of earth, which is what I often used to do. We certainly didn't have, I mean, the family camera wasn't used in that way. Although um, I think it would have been destroyed a long time ago if a photo like that would have existed. Because it, it would have upset, you know, any notion that everything was all right. The problem with photography as it stands now is that when we look at a picture of ourselves, we try and make it do too much work. I think the whole of our society tries to push us to a notion of coherence in who we are, you know, that everything is coherent and it all hangs together easily. And I'd say for most people that isn't true at all, that we actually live out different selves even in the course of five minutes and we call upon different parts of our history and act in relation to them without knowing it. And this is constantly going on. Well, let's say now, filming. I mean, I'm under a great deal of tension. You know, there's a, I, there's a lot expected of me that I've got to deliver. And actually, one part of me is like a, a screaming three-year-old that says, for God's sake, get on with it. Do we have to do it yet another time? And wants to get up and run out and eat something out of the fridge. But the other part of me that's on overdrive says, I've got to be calm and collected, I've got to get my thoughts together. And there is a tension between those two. And w what is winning, hopefully, is the, is the latter. <laughs>
picture I got with my mum and dad together is of uh, they obviously were smudged in a pub, and the pub was the Minerva in South End. They're Irish, you see, and it's when they were first together in South End. And it's quite an interesting picture because uh, I was talking to my brother Christopher, and he said, to, he said that you can imagine that picture, can't you? Five seconds or so, he said, couldn't you shut up? Five seconds after, I will not you stop nagging? But on the picture, is <laughs> laughing and smiling, you know, she's laughing and smiling, most of it. I mean, it, I could not get a more opposite version of the reality of their life. It couldn't be possible. But it's a myth, you know, and I held the myth as well. I had it copied. All the sons and daughters had got a copy of it. You know, times passed, when times could have been all right. pictures that I've taken with, like nowadays on the estate in London and the rest of it, very sharp, posh gear Nikon. I gave it to one person, <gasps> poor old Marianne herself, gave me it back. Too sharp for her, too sharp. And there's me talking about you must preserve your history, you must be honest. Too sharp, she wanted a clunky picture, which was well out of focus and as hazy and say, oh, that's Marianne. And write herself into it. And in reality, all these structures in the photographs of the geese around, they write themselves into it a lot of the time, you know? And often I think the more you crowd into a picture, don't worry about the focus, don't worry about the content, the form, the dyes, and the, get them all in, and then they can write it themselves. When I look at my photographs, because they're talking to me, I feel lifted, carried away, you know. I think it's, it sent memories going through me, and I think of the days when I sit on the rocks and watch the rivers bubbling down towards me. I think of the days when I'll sit on the rocks and watch the waves splashing up over me. I like this photograph of my daughter because it was her first time to America. She found this river without anybody showing her around. She was highlighted, you know, really excited about this pretty, pretty place, this beautiful place. And she took me to see it. Her face, she was living a child again. You know, life had come to her out of the water. If that photograph could talk, you could have a good look at it and you would see. She was in laughter, she was throwing the water up like this, and I was standing back with the camera, trying not to laugh too much because I didn't want to shake it. I wanted a good photograph of you. Stop that, stop that. It's got to be good of you. You look like a baby all over again. <laughs> you know, that, I hope I never lose that photograph. I really do. That when I'm dying, my photographs will be scattered all around me, thrown on my belly, my head, and everywhere. And I hope somebody will take a picture of me and my photographs. People come on a holiday basically for a fantasy to forget whatever is going wrong or is difficult in their life. Unfortunately, it isn't as easy as that. You can't drop 50 weeks or 48 weeks, depending on how much holiday you get, in two weeks. 
And so it never really happens. And so you get the old archetypal thing, girl goes away to lose her virginity, boy goes away to LA and the rest of it. You get all those stories and really it's rare to happen. And when it does, Jesus Christ Almighty, you know, <laughs> it ain't it. Sparks don't fly and the earth don't move, you know, and the rest of it. And it's, it's, but you can always get a picture which says, get your arm around her, say sex or cheese, whichever you prefer, click. There's the myth and there's the proof. Come in to watch me, and we'll get you organised, we'll get it up. Come on, a couple of minutes. There's plenty of snaps of holidays in the family album, but what's really missing is any kind of work. Um, right over your head. That's so good. good. Ironically, there are depressed work areas where you can actually have a souvenir photograph taken as a fake worker. When you see this big horse resting after a hard shift, you look too healthy. I have, I've got it. If your hand is over the eyes, if you give it a push back, it's like twist to one side, it will stick to your head for a few moments. Right, you are. You need to help up on that front there, man. I've got you under control now, Drew. Uh, now then, it's a good check on those elements. The body in the middle. Push your hand back off the eyes a bit, that's it. Couldn't see much more in the end of your nose. That's better. Straight towards me, come on. And we'll try it again. Beans, cheese, or sausages, or all, all of them, whichever, but just have it on the first go, shall we? After three. One, two, three, and... Cheese! All right, get. <laughs> One, two, three, and... Have another go. One, two, three, and... Cheese! 1985 was the first time that I was going to go to Africa. And one was looking forward to that. One had to save for it. And the first time I bought myself a small box camera, I was going to take lots and lots of pictures. Of course, Joe had his uh, Super 8. Uh, and we took the normal leaving and entering gamble uh, pictures. But when we started uh, the tours, because it was one of these package holidays with tours to it, I found that I could no longer take pictures. The first place we went to was on a boat, and uh, they were pointing out different slave points and where people were taken from and so on. The pain of that was so much that I could not take my camera up. And when I look around at, we were the only two black people on the trip. And when I look around at the Europeans photographing those places and listening to the stories that the Africans was telling them about slaves and what happened to them, the pain of that was too much. I could not take any pictures. These places meant reliving my parents' past. And uh, the hurts that are still felt by black people today. People going on package holidays do learn things. It reinforces their stereotypes. They come back knowing it all because they've been there and they've seen it for themselves. And here is the proof, there's my pictures to prove it. So it reinforces the stereotyping of black people. And very few of them take the trouble to look behind the scenes at what they're really seeing. Like going to the clinic and really looking at somebody who's been seen to by a doctor. Could you imagine that being done in Europe? Could you imagine an English woman allowing a horde of black people to come in and to just stand up and gulp at her while a doctor examines her? I felt that that was too much. 
but of course it has to be laid on so that the photography can go on and that the pictures can come here and they can see how they live and how they're it's dreadful I, I, I couldn't photograph things like that. and then all the cameras come out and everybody's clicking But there's certain times where gestures and moods get captured and I, I, I don't feel like I want to be represented in that way. You know, it's like, I didn't choose that, you chose that. You know, whoever's taking the photo, I didn't choose to show myself in that way. So no, you know, no, you can't have it. For me, when, when somebody takes a photograph, it's almost like they're stealing a part of your soul. They're freezing you for an instant in time, which you can never change. I think, for me, but for black people generally, it's important to be represented properly and well and accurately. So if I think about it in that way, um, that's why, I suppose, I would want to have more control about how I'm represented. Uh, uh, lots of feelings about having my photo taken. I hate it. I hate it. And most photos that are taken of me, I just detest and throw them away. I want to control aspects of myself, and part of that includes my image. I want to be in control of my life. I think when people take a photograph that I have a right to say, this is, this is how it should look. When the, when the camera's actually pointing at me, I get a very strong sense of uh, uh, invasion or somebody prying. It feels very frightening when you ask that question. I mean, it's, it feels like taking away my history, which feels very tenuous anyway. My photos are really important to me. I'd feel less rich. I'd feel that the richness of my identity would be missing. I can't imagine not having them. I wouldn't, it's funny, I don't want to imagine not having them. A terrible thing. If I, lo if I lost a photograph, it would be a horrible thing. You know that uh, I, I'm, I think I'm still paranoid about uh, fire at home. And uh, I remember once that there was some fire going on next door. And I said, well, what, what should I take with me from my house? Because I had to leave my house. And uh, I was so in, I was in a panic. I couldn't remember where my documents were, money, etc. But I remember where my photographs were. <laughs> I feel terrible when people take my my photographs away. I feel terrible when I find one damaged. I feel that they're damaging me. What What would I do if I didn't have a camera? <laughs> How could I keep my identity? If I lost all my photographs, <laughs> um, yeah, I would have lost part of myself. If I lost uh, my photographs, I'd feel as though I'd lost part of myself. If I lost my photographs, I'd feel as though I'd lost part of myself. Mm. 